Hello, everyone, and welcome back to WordFence Live. Last week, we were informed of a large-scale attack that the U.S. Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or the CISA, says, quote, poses a grave risk to the federal government, end quote. SolarWinds, a network management system software provider, was the victim of this supply chain attack. We're going to go over what happened, who did it, what does this mean for us, the WordPress users? So stay tuned. The WordFence threat intelligence team is ready to talk about it. We'll be right back to get started in a moment. Thanks for joining us today on WordFence Live. Today is December 22nd, 2020. We hope that you're having a great week and we're happy you're joining us again today. Let us know where you're viewing from. I'm streaming live from just south of the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania area. We always love to see where our viewers are watching from. My name is Scott Miller. I'm a customer support engineer here with WordFence. In a few moments, I'm gonna be joined by the CEO of WordFence, Mark Maunder is going to be back on the stream today. We will also have QA engineer and threat analyst Ram Gall joining us, as well as threat analyst Chloe Chamberlain. So as I talked about just a moment ago, on December 8th, uh, Tuesday, December 8th, the security world saw big news here that FireEye, a top security firm that provides security services, including penetration testing services to governments and large organizations, uh, was hacked by a nation state. Uh, a few days later, on December 13th, we find that the Treasury Department and the Commerce Department and other government agencies were also compromised. Then on Monday, December 14th, the next day, we learned that both FireEye and the government intrusions had a singular cause, and it was a supply chain attack that was perpetrated on solar winds, a nearly ubiquitous network management software solution that's used by large organizations, government agencies, internet service providers, and so on. With the news of this intrusion still developing, we're taking a look at what happened, why it happened, and whether or not this could happen to a nearly ubiquitous content management system, WordPress. So today we're going to ask the experts. we got Chloe Chamberlain, Ram Gall, and Mark Maunder all joining us to discuss this issue in depth. If you're excited about the stream, hit the like button. You can hit the subscribe button, the bell. You'll be notified when we go live going forward. Typically, we're live each Tuesday at noon Eastern time, 9 a.m. Pacific. As we're saying in chat, in the comments, you know, please don't post anything sensitive there. If you have anything directly related to your site, maybe a compromise or an issue there, you can write in directly at feedback at wordfence.com and use the subject line WordFence Live. So let's get started by bringing in the CEO of Defiant WordFence, Mark Maunder, as well as threat analysts, Ram Gall and Chloe Chamberlain. Welcome everybody, how is it going? I'm feeling Ram a little um, out of place without an ugly sweater. <laughs> you guys, <laughs> that's <are> awesome. <laughs> I love the antlers and, and the bells there. Uh, that's that's an awesome touch. Oh, my God, the bells and the beard. <laughs> Very cool. Susan, Susan says hello from Pittsburgh. Nice to see other Pennsylvania. So uh, let's just dive right into it. Uh, you know, I just mentioned that these uh, seem to be a supply, uh, from what we know, a supply chain attack. Ram, can you give us an overview of what that is and a little bit of what we've seen lately? Sure. Uh, so a supply chain attack is, uh, wait, is, was this going to be one of our trivia questions? <laughs> um, it may very well be, right? Okay. Uh, well, a supply <laughs> chain attack basically involves gaining access to a system by uh, targeting a trusted third party. Um, used by that system. So this can be like any point in the supply chain. Uh, you, remember, you guys remember the 2013 target breach, uh, which was the biggest retail breach in history at the time? Uh, it turns out that the attackers uh, targeted one of their HVAC suppliers, uh, which had credentials under their network, and then they used that to pivot into their point of sale system and steal credit card data. Um, and then there was NotPetya, which caused billions of dollars worth of damage, and uh, that was in a Ukrainian accounting software. It looks like attackers gained access to their updating servers and uh, basically backdoored them and put uh, wiperware in 
the accounting software. And that did a lot, a lot of damage. Mark, so, what was so, Well, so, so it's interesting, Ram, because in the Target attack, wasn't that a supplier to Target who had some kind of, was it a, a VPN or some connection like that? And they came in via that, but it wasn't software being supplied to, tar to Target. It was one of their suppliers. Right? Correct, but both count as a supply chain attack. One of the reasons supply chain attacks are so dangerous is because the supply chain is a huge attack surface. Yeah, yeah, and it's interesting. You, so maybe one can differentiate it into, uh, you know, the, the the supply chain of software components or software itself mm -hmm. versus the relationships with suppliers that are being exploited and the connections, including logical network connections that one has with them. Just to like nitpick, you know me, I'm a nitpicker. Well, we can totally do that. But uh, yeah, it, it, yeah, there's there's lots of ways this can go wrong, I guess, is kind of what I'm getting at. Yeah, uh, interesting bit of history there. Yeah. Well, hopefully uh, everybody was taking notes as uh, Ram gave you a heads up that may be a swag-related question. Uh, so these sorts of attacks, uh, Mark, Chloe, Ram, these are not very, very common, are they? But they're one of the more damaging attacks that you can see. Is is that right? Well, historically, yes. Uh, the ones that have occurred have been extremely damaging. You guys remember the Sea Cleaner thing? Uh, I think that was right after Avast uh, bought them. But Sea Cleaner was a like basically a you know downloadable uh, basic virus and configuration scanner for like home and workstation PCs, and uh, an attacker managed to inject uh, malware into one of their downloads. I think this was in 2017. So. We're not actually sure what degree of damage that caused, but when they do happen, everyone freaks out for good reason. Mm -hmm. And then not to steal uh, your, your script, Ram, but um, Soiza was, yes. was a supply chain attack, right? Yeah, uh, you wrote about that one. Uh, basically, there was a... You, you, I'll let you tell the story, because... <laughs> oh, well, I, I I've, uh, let me dig into my memory here, but uh, Mason Soiza was a... Um, threat actor, to put it mildly, who is, is still based in the UK. And as far as I know, to this point, to this day, remains unprosecuted. Uh, he was going around buying up WordPress plugins. Um, do you guys recall which plugins they were? Uh, I think it was 404301 was one of them. Yeah, and I think one of them was uh, WP Maintenance Mode, which had like 500,000 mm -hmm. installs at the time, which... Okay. And so, uh, so he was buying plugins, and then we spotted this. We kind of like broke the story because um, we saw malware being embedded in plugins and uh, we started talking to plugin authors and they were like, well, I sold that plugin. And we're like, well, who did you sell it to? Oh, this guy. And you know, initially people didn't really want to talk, but you know, got folks on the phone and they actually um, across the board, they were really helpful and allowed us to follow the money. So we actually ended up with like bank statements and transfers and so on. Um, and we figured out that it's this guy in the UK called Mason Doiser, who was buying plugins, installing malware into them, and then distributing, uh, just releasing the code into the repo. So you just, you know, update your favorite plugin, and bang, uh, you had, for example, ads for a prostitution service in the UK appearing on your website. One of those websites that was targeted in that with that particular ad was a school in the UK. Um, and so we went after him, and I, I can probably talk about this now because it's been quite a while, but we actually collaborated with FBI on this, um, chatted with them. They said, hey, um, this is UK, you know, can connect you with national cybercrime, which we chatted to. And then we were kind of like rooted to um, West Midlands police. We chatted with them. This is, this is more information on this than I think I've ever really, you know, <laughs> shared, but whatever. Uh, and West Midlands, uh, we gave them a, a docket, basically, and they um, they ran with it, and I should probably just stop there because um, I, I, it may be ongoing. Um, BBC's Panorama reached out to us uh, a while after this, maybe even a year, nine months to a year after after we broke the story, and said, "So is it up to no good again, uh, trading illegal pharmaceuticals via a loophole in EU law and selling addictive drugs into the UK market?" So they broke that story, and it was actually a doctor who is the presenter of the show. I forget her name, but she's she's brilliant. And um, and I think they did a lot of public good there. Um, but I don't think that Mason Soiza has been charged uh, at all. But anyway, just bring it back to this. Uh, that is an example of a 
supply chain attack that targeted WordPress via the repo. <laughs> so. Yes, and I think we're going to talk about another uh, supply chain attack that uh, our lead developer, Matt Barry, uh, eff effect effectively right. found a vulnerability uh, that could have led to the largest supply chain attack ever and uh, notified WordPress so they could fix it before that happened. But we'll, I think we'll get to that at a later section of the show. Now, Mark, oh, man. you have a little uh, history to lead up to what we're going to talk about today. Is that right? Yeah. So, you know, I was, uh, uh, so, so I think Ram and Chloe are going to dive into the technical details of uh, solar winds and uh, the issues around that and kind of bring us all up to date. Um, I was thinking about this and, you know, I got to tell you, I laughed out loud when I read a statement from the Russian embassy, uh, which came out uh, a few days ago. They said, this is an official statement from the Russian embassy, uh, the, the, the Russian embassy, or, or Russia, does not, because quote, does not conduct offensive operations in the cyber domain. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. Good to know. False alarm, false flag, clearly. Let's move on, guys. It's not Russia. Um, all right. So anyway, so I started thinking about this and uh, thinking about history. And uh, so I thought I'd just go over some fun history on Russia conducting offensive operations in the cyber domain, uh, starting off with 1986 at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Now, there's a book being written about this called Cuckoo's Egg, and I bet you some of our audience have read it. So if you have... Uh, you know, definitely mention it in the comments. But uh, this was a hack at um, uh, Berkeley National Labs in 86. Someone had not paid 75 cents for computer time. And uh, Cliff, Clifford Stoll, who wrote the book uh, on this, was asked by his supervisor to resolve the issue. Stoll uh, realized that the uh, someone had gotten super user access by exploiting the move mail function in Emacs. And yes, Emacs has actually been around that long, which is insane you think about it. Uh, and he ended up kind of going down a rabbit hole and using 50 terminals and teleprinters, because this is 1986, which he hooked up to 50 phone lines at the LBNL at uh, Berkeley Labs to figure out which line the hacker was coming in on. And uh, when the hacker dialed in, he located the phone that was being used, and he figured out the call was coming from TimeNet. And uh, TimeNet back then was a provider of packet switching uh, networks, X25 networks, which is Interesting for me because uh, about 1990, um, a, I was a slightly sh darker shade of gray than gray hat in terms of hacking. And a friend of mine had been dumpster diving and gave me something called a NUI, which was a access code to access an X25 network. So I would dial into the X25 network, authenticate with my stolen credentials and uh, Yes, I was a very bad person once upon a time. And um, I would then uh, be able to connect to what's called a DTE, a data term terminating equipment in the US, which is essentially a Hayes modem. And I could send it, this is from South Africa, I could send it uh, Hayes commands, AT, DT, and then the, the bulletin board number that I wanted to connect to in Orange County. So I would connect to Digital Decay run by Arclight and uh, learned for the first time about Linux and things like that. Um, using a hacked X25 network. But this attacker was coming in via X25. And so TimeNet helped um, Cliff track down, track it down to a call center at, believe it or not, RAM, MITRE, the same one your CVEs come from. This is one of the first major Russian hacks in the US. And uh, the, uh, the attacker was routing themselves via a call center at MITRE. Uh, and so they realized uh, he was coming into MITRE on a 1200 modem and still set up another teleprinter so he could monitor everything the hacker did. And basically this guy was looking for nuclear secrets across military bases in the US, uh, doing dictionary attacks, uh, installing Trojans to seal more credentials. And uh, he was mainly targeting military bases and many of the credentials on the military bases in 1986 were guest and guest. So <laughs> good old days. And um, at the time, FBI, CIA and NSA and Air Force couldn't figure out who had jurisdiction over the case. So they were kind of like, you know, dragging their feet on investigating it. And uh, Cliff continued his investigation. And he figured out that the attacker was active from about noon onwards, which is unusual because at the time, phone calls uh, in the US were really expensive at that time. And most hackers were active at night. And so uh, he basically figured out they were in an Eastern time zone. And then with TimeNet's help, he uh, and the German post office, they uh, traced it to a West German university in Bremen. 
they set up a honeypot uh, for this guy pretending there was a new agency within Berkeley Labs called SDI and the hacker really wanted in. So uh, he went after this and they traced him to his home in Hanover. And the hacker's name ended up, they caught him. And the hacker's name is Marcus Hess and he'd been selling secrets to KGB, the, a, the uh, agency from this um, country that does not conduct offensive operations in the cyber domain, right? Uh, and so Marcus had been selling secrets to the, uh, to the KGB and they actually verified this when a Hungarian agent contacted this fictitious SDI net that they'd set up uh, at uh, Berkeley Labs. Uh, this uh, Hungarian agent tried to contact uh, SDI via mail, just regular snail mail, to get some info. And what they figured out is that this is KGB verifying Marcus Hess's intelligence. A little bit of tradecraft there for you. And uh, so that's basically how, how the U.S. confirmed that, um, that it was uh, Russia and that... Uh, uh, and, and so on. So basically, Hess had been selling information to the KGB for $54,000 total. They estimate he broke into 400 military computers and uh, they, he stole data on semiconductors, satellites, space and aircraft technologies. And uh, he was found guilty of espionage. And uh, for some reason that I don't understand, it was only, well, actually, I, do, I think I do understand it. It was only given a 20 uh, month suspended sentence. So basically, he didn't serve any time. But this is the 80s, right? Back when. Um, Hacking was uh, not considered as bad as it is today. And that changed around 1995 with the arrest of Kevin Mitnick when Janet Reno and the Clinton administration went after him and they got real aggressive prosecuting hackers after that. I think Mitnick got five years, if I'm not mistaken. But anyway, so, you know, that's kind of the, one of the first um, uh, instances of Russia conducting offensive operations in the cyber domain, Russian embassy. Yeah, um, the passwords are yeah. much more secure these days. They use admin and admin or uh, solar winds one, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> right. Totally. Yeah. Progress, right? Progress. So, <laughs> right. And uh, then the next one is Moonlight Maze, which is in 1999. And that a lot of the details on this are still classified. But uh, basically what happened there is that... Um, there was a Moonlight Maze is the name of a US government investigation into a massive data breach of classified data. Uh, and it started in 96 and the investigation went through until 1999. Um, by, the, by 1999, the task force uh, investigating Moonlight Maze had 40 specialists on it with a range of skill sets. Um, Russia was blamed. You know, again, it was classified data. So a lot of the um, investigations were classified as well. Uh, they, it's one of the, supposedly one of the uh, first widely known uh, cyber espionage campaigns in history. Although I would say that uh, Cuckoo's Egg is clearly cyber espionage as well. Um, and they think that the same threat actor that was involved in Moonlight Maze continued uh, to use sim similar methods until 2016. Um, but you know what's really crazy is the one of the guys who worked on Moonlight Maze back in 99 is Kevin Mandia, who is the CEO of FireEye. FireEye. Right. And, uh, it and, used to be Mandiant, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, I didn't know there was going to be a quiz. Sorry. <laughs> but yeah, I think, I think by Ram, and I mean, it's Man Kevin Mandia, Mandiant, I think is the founder of Mandiant. And I think they were acquired by FireEye, but, uh, don't quote me on that. Um, but I just thought it was super interesting because, you know, this was attributed to Russia in 99, 20 years later. Uh, Mandia's company, FireEye, is the first one that is kind of reported as being breached by Soda Winds. Um, so, so kind of an interesting connection there. And then, uh, you know, moving swiftly on to uh, Buckshot Yankee in 2008, where someone picked up a rogue USB stick and uh, put it into the wrong computer on an overseas uh, US military base. And uh, they basically breached US Central Command. And uh, this allowed the attacker to, to penetrate uh, air-gapped systems, which are systems that are required to not be connected to the open internet. Um, and the hacker was in there for four months. Uh, they linked this to the same group that was behind Moonlight Maze, this 99 attack that I mentioned that Mandia was involved in, um, and uh, attributed it to, to Russia. The cleanup took 14 months. Uh, the worm was named Agent BTZ, and uh, it could... Uh, scan computers for data, open back doors, uh, send data through the back doors and um, to a, a C2 server or, or command and control server. 
Um, so, so Russia was suspected to be behind the attacks because they'd reused code in the agent BTZ malware that was used in other attacks. And uh, this led to th that breach, um, Buckshot Yankee actually led directly to the creation of US Cyber Command in uh, 2008. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the reasons uh, FireEye is reluctant to actually attribute this to any given uh, threat actor is because none of the code was reused from previous uh, code used by other threat actors. Yeah, I, so I hadn't read that, Ram, but that's super interesting. And the other thing that I found in an interview with Kevin Mandia is that uh, they use clean infrastructure. So all of the IPs that attacked FireEye were based in the US and had never been used in any other attack. They were completely clean, right? Yeah, which definitely points to a nation state actor of some sort. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, so that's kind of the, you know, to, going from, you know, 1986 to 1999 to 2008. And then, you know, I guess starting around 2008, uh, the term APT or advanced persistent threats started being used, uh, you know, in, in the sort of public parlance. Um, and we started talking about APT 28, which is Fancy Bear. Um, and they're also known as Pawn Storm, Zara Team, Strontium. But uh, in the US, they're generally known as either as Fancy Bear or APT-28. And uh, they're identified as a Russian cyber espionage group. Um, and uh, the UK's Foreign and Commonwealth Office, as well as SecureWorks and Threat Connect and FireEye, or FireEye's Mandiant, there you go, Ram. Uh, have also said that the group is sponsored by the Russian government. So generally it's accepted that APT-28 or Fancy Bear is the Russian government. Um, and in 2018, there was an indictment by the US uh, Special Counsel, which identified Fancy Bear as Russian GRU Unit 26165. So these guys target uh, government, military and security organizations, especially NATO states, which is obviously a, an alliance that's uh, kind of opposed militarily to, to Russia or in opposition to, to Russia. And uh, Fancy Bear has targeted the German parliament, Norwegian parliament, uh, TV5 Monde in France, the White House, NATO, the Democratic National Committee, which I'm sure you're all sick of hearing about, uh, the Organization, uh, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, and, the, um, and then Macron's uh, campaign uh, when he was a presidential candidate. Um, and they're mainly using zero days, spear phishing and, and malware. Um, you know, so that's Fancy Bear and, and uh, AKA APT28. Uh, Cozy Bear is the sort of other Russian threat group that folks talk about. And what's interesting about Cozy Bear is that when um, this was first reported a few days ago, the solar winds hack, uh, the New York Times and the Washington Post mentioned that it was being attributed to Cozy Bear from unnamed sources. Now, Rem, I think you were saying that FireEye hasn't confirmed this, right? They're not attributing it yet. Yes, they're they're not confirming attribution on it yet, though. I mean, from what I recall, they do think that it's a Russian APT. Right, right. Yeah, that Probably. seems to be the, the vibe that we're feeling. Uh, and so, you know, unnamed sources are saying it is Cozy Bear. Uh, the background on Cozy Bear, as opposed to Fancy Bear, you gotta get your bears right, folks. Uh, <laughs> is that uh, the uh, the Dutch uh, General Intelligence and Security Service, the AIVD, actually used uh, security camera footage to confirm that Cozy Bear is led by the Russian SVR or their uh, Foreign Intelligence Service. Cozy Bear is also known as Office Monkeys, Cozy Car, the Dukes, and Cozy Duke. I think Cozy Duke's actually a name of some malware that they've used as well. And um, they have previously attacked the U.S. Democratic Party in 2014, the State Department in 2014, the White House in 2014, and then around 2015, they spearfished the Pentagon, which caused the Pentagon to shut down the entire joint staff unclassified email system. And then in uh, 2016, Cozy Bear was implicated in attacks on the DNC with Fancy Bear. And what's kind of hilarious there is that Cozy Bear and Fancy Bear were both in the same system at the same time, but reportedly not aware of each other. So. You know, with the solar winds thing, you you did hear that there were actually two different backdoors and two different DLLs. Uh, no, in the same package. Uh, yeah, uh, one was the uh, main uh, sunburst attack, 
uh, which was in the Orion business module deal. And that's the one that we discovered first. Uh, that's the one with the, you know, intense C2 infrastructure. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's a second one that they're calling Supernova, which was a, basically a very cleverly hidden web shell uh, in an image request library. Interesting. Interesting. And so there may have been multiple APTs doing this. Yeah, super interesting, Ram. So um, so these guys have also attacked U.S. think tanks in 2016, the Norwegian government in uh, 2017, uh, again, <laughs> um, uh, and uh, the Dutch ministries in 2017. And then um, in 2020, uh, July of this year, uh, Cozy Bear was accused uh, by the NSA, uh, the NCSC, which is the National Cybersecurity Center, and uh, Canada, their uh, communication security establishment or CSC of trying to steal data on vaccines and treatments for COVID-19 being developed in the UK, US and Canada. And uh, just as a reminder, there's a close collaboration between the UK, US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand in the form of Five Eyes, which is a a, uh, multi-decade or perhaps more than half a century now intelligence sharing arrangement. So I guess uh, they're kind of investigating that. and then, uh, yeah, of course, FireEye initially reporting that uh, uh, um, there has been a Trojanization of SolarWinds Orion business software updates in order to distribute uh, malware. And I think FireEye is calling it Sunburst. Does that sound familiar? Correct, yeah. Sunburst is uh, what they're talking about, the uh, backdoor. Uh, the, they initially found a backdoor in uh, SolarWinds Orion. Yeah, so, uh, you know, uh, FireEye CEO Kevin Mandia is calling this the uh, potentially one of the most successful cyber espionage campaigns ever. And uh, he, he went on to say in an interview that uh, NPR published, um, so this is somebody who is patient, professional, and what made this interesting to me is I felt they were more interested in staying surreptitious and clandestine than they were about accomplishing their mission. Yeah. In which case, hacking FireEye might not have been the smartest move. <laughs> <laughs> right. Although I guess if you're doing a uh, supply chain attack, it might be a little bit of a shotgun, right? You might not have control of where your uh, infected uh, supply is being distributed to. Yeah, it's that. I mean, that is the good news and the bad news. Uh, apparently, they uh, something like eighteen thousand uh, SolarWinds customers downloaded a uh, backdoored version of Orion. Uh, so I'm going to give a little bit of background. Scott mentioned it earlier, but yeah. Orion, so, so, so Ram, I, I need to bail. Uh, as discussed, I, I need to make another meeting urgently um, at the bottom of the hour over here. So uh, I'm going to step out. I will say goodbye. And Ram and Chloe, take it away. <laughs> all right. Well, bye, Mark. Thank Thanks you. for uh, Thanks coming for on the show. Me. Okay. All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Ciao. Have a good one. So, all right, Ram. Yeah, give us, give us the uh, details there. The DEETs, as they call them. Uh, so SolarWinds uh, has been around for a while. They do network monitoring and management software. And Orion is basically their one thing to rule them all. It's software where you put it on a server or a server cluster, and you can use it to not only see what's going on inside your entire network, but configure your entire network. Uh, and that means it had a lot of capabilities. So it it's a fairly attractive target, um, an attacker that could control. And, you know, uh, Orion has been a target of, you know, pen testers in the past, not from a supply chain angle, but from a, if you can pop the Orion server, then you have a lot of, you know, you can pivot to a lot of other places. Uh, and part of that is that in order to do what it does, in order to see what's going on in your network and change things in your network, you can you have to feed it credentials of accounts that are allowed to do that uh so basically anything that can completely you know if you have a backdoor into orion even though it stores those credentials in an encrypted form it has to decrypt them at some point in order to use them and that means that uh if you have a backdoor into orion the backdoor then has access to the accounts that you've fed to orion to do those things uh chloe i think you uh were talking about how you was using saml tokens for this yeah i briefly read that they were generating uh, sml tokens just to maintain persistence one of the reasons why we think it's an advanced persistent threat um and they were just doing this to maintain persistence and gain access to other uh, resources um in the network yeah yeah and uh saml tokens are basically a way for uh applications to you know 
they're a way to authenticate between different applications and different segments of a network, right? Yeah, I believe so. Okay, cool. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, and the tricky thing about this is that the attackers, uh, they initially did a test run back la back in last year, right? They uh, was, it, was it April of last year where they did a yeah, proof of concept? So, so there's evidence that of April of last year, there were some modifications to a, um, a, a version that was released. Um, and I also read in another blog post that there's evidence that um, they were doing dry runs to see if uh, what they did uh, would work. Um, so that's really interesting to note. And I think they might be correlated, those two things, yeah. Yeah, well, I, I think last year uh, a uh, security researcher named Vinod Kumar uh, reported that he'd found credentials to the SolarWinds update server in a public yeah. GitHub repository. <laughs> and uh, they used the password of SolarWinds123. So uh, the good news really is that, strong. yeah, that is really strong. I, One, two, I, three. I mean, you're you're good. It, it, you know what they should have done? They should have added a, an apostrophe, or not an apostrophe, an exclamation point. That would have mm -hmm. made it uncrackable. Uh, but anyways, this wasn't the only way they got in. Uh, part of that is that, uh, and what's interesting about this is that the attackers actually signed the malicious update. Uh, so they had they somehow gained access to uh, either a server used to sign the uh, malicious update or to the certificate or keys used to sign the update itself uh, though i think it was probably the former and what's big about that is that if you have signed code that means that a lot of antivirus programs uh, security programs aren't are going to basically treat it better they're going to treat it as trusted software so uh, that's where we kind of ran into problems. Now, the separate web shell we mentioned, that was not signed code, uh, which, do, which is an other indicator that it was probably a separate APT. Curiously, but, speculation, if there's two separate like backdoors, um, if there's two separate APTs working on it, could it have been the same like initial intrusion vector that they both discovered and um, both planted things separately? Yeah, I mean, yeah, if if the FTP password was SolarWinds123, it's possible that was maybe their initial intrusion vector. Yeah. Um, it, there's still a bunch of speculation on that, but one thing we can know is that an organization that uses that as an important password probably doesn't have a great security posture in other places. Yep. <laughs> so now, we don't actually wanted, know how... Sorry. Oh, no, I was going to say... Uh, I want to give uh, go back and get a little overview of what we're talking about here. I know uh, everybody got the uh, cyber espionage uh, lead up there and the history. I've also heard Chloe and Ram uh, mention APT a few times. So let's get to our swag question here. Uh, we're going to throw the link into the chat and we will do the first 10 people to guess or correctly answer what does APT stand for. We went over it. Uh, a few times, I believe Mark uh, had brought it up as well. So. And answer in the link, please, and not in the chat, because you don't want to blow it for everyone. Unless yes. you're, you know. <laughs> Unless that's what you're out to do, I guess, yeah. right, Ram? <laughs> <laughs> so um, going back, for anybody who's just joining, um, what we know as far as the dates here, and Ram or Chloe, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, December 8th, FireEye announced that they had been hacked by a nation state. Uh, as we said, you know, it couldn't be Russia. Russia said they didn't do it, so. <laughs> it, it was, uh, it, we don't know who it was, but it was totally not the Russians. Definitely not the Russians. Then on the 13th, we learned that the U.S. Treasury Department had been hacked by the same group that hacked FireEye, and SolarWinds was involved uh, there in both. Then the next day on the 14th, uh, both FireEye and the government intrusions had a singular cause there, and it was a supply chain attack on SolarWinds. Um, so anything else since then that we know of? Uh, well, Microsoft took down one of the main C2 domains. So, okay, C2 stands for command and control. Uh, so what this, what the Sunburst malware would do was it would just sort of chill out once it was in a system for anywhere from a few minutes to a few weeks. Uh, and eventually it would phone home to uh, a primary C2 domain. Uh, and that C2 domain would basically respond with, okay, here's where I want you to, you know, request updates from from here on out, and it would give them a secondary C2 domain. 
uh, in order to, to request further updates and instructions. Uh, so Microsoft actually seized that first C2 domain. And uh, what that means is, okay, so we mentioned that 18,000 uh, SolarWinds customers downloaded the uh, backdoored Orion product. The good news is that this attacker only really focused on a handful of high value targets. What that means is that they, you know, used that access to gain deeper access into these targets' networks. Um, by seizing that uh, primary C2 domain uh, and basically uh, black holing it, m making it so that requests to it didn't send any responses, uh, Microsoft ensured that any of the other organizations that downloaded the uh, backdoored. Orion product, uh, no further pivoting is going to be at least easy uh, because if they haven't actually sent that request yet, if they send that, re that request now, they're not going to get a response. Um, the bad news is that for any of the targeted high value organizations, the attackers have very likely found other ways in and added other backdoors. So we've mentioned solar winds a few times. Uh, Chloe, can you give us just a little insight? What is solar winds for anybody who's just unfamiliar completely? Yeah, so it's just a network management system. So I think uh, Ram discussed this a little bit, but um, basically it's just a way to manage your network and um, monitor things. Um, okay. And it's usually used for security which is ironic in this case. Um, <laughs> it, it's to manage things and, and hopefully improve your security posture in most cases. And that's the network management system that uh, that Ram had mentioned, the NMS. That would have been a, another good swag question, maybe uh, yeah. a, a, another time. Um, yeah. So, well, well, Mark's uh, mentioned how configuration management is like critical to security. So if you take control of the current configuration management software, then... Yeah. And that's what makes it so like so so big is that it, it was a supply chain attack. You trust the software. Um, you have no reason to suspect that anything's bad because you trust the software. And so you're just installing it with that trust and it goes undetected for months. And yeah, so it's, it's pretty crazy and pretty big and, and very stealthy. <laughs> now, how many people use solar winds? Uh, so, you know, I keep on seeing the answer that's 300,000 plus customers across the world. As far as users of the Orion software, I think it's maybe 10% of that. I think somewhere around 30,000, 33,000. Okay. Yeah, so uh, so it's not the number one, uh, it's, it's not the most widely used um, as far as... Uh, yeah, I think Splunk. I think Splunk has a bigger user base, uh, but I think they're number three as far as like network management software. Yeah. So a lot of very big people use them. Uh, top five accounting firms, something like four hundred ninety of the Fortune five hundred. Uh, several U.S. government departments, uh, backbone internet providers, including my own internet provider, <laughs> my own ISP. Don't tell uh, them was that. Considered <laughs> high value target. They're watching me right now. <laughs> so. Yeah. And so it's and, probably one of the reasons why it was a target, too, is because they might not have known who was using it, but it was number three. So it was a good uh, target for them to take. And then I read somewhere that the malware would actually because they didn't know uh, who was using it prior to infecting uh, the software. And so part of the malware would check and see um, what who was running the software before they figured out if it was a um, someone they wanted to target further and take that like stage two attack. We yeah. have um, many, many uh, comments about your antlers, uh, Chloe. <laughs> Everybody loves the antlers and the bells. The um, antlers are great. I have to say, I really dig the like light up uh, thing. I had some light up beard ornaments, but they were too bright. <laughs> it's like the best $5 I've ever spent. <laughs> nice. So you had mentioned that uh, Microsoft uh, had some affected, and I believe the number was around 18,000 Solar Winds customers that were affected. Do we know uh, who else has been affected or may potentially become affected? Uh, Microsoft. So uh, it's not going to be more than those 18,000 users or 18,000 organizations that downloaded the infected uh, Orion product. Uh, Microsoft noticed, uh, basically they found a way to decode the sort of, uh, subdomains that were 
sent out to the original C2 uh, domain, and they managed to identify something like 40 organizations that were especially targeted for a, a second stage of attacks. Um, as we mentioned, uh, there were some, you know, universities, uh, ISPs, stuff like that. So, Now, are there any other details that we haven't covered to this point as far as what we know about the attack specifically? You had mentioned that there were a couple, um, it, there was uh, a back door and, and another method in there. Uh, as far as that, do we know anything else in depth? We haven't heard it too much about that. Uh, again, it's a web shell, so it's it was, you know, in a way it was more silent because it was it wouldn't do anything until someone sent it commands. Uh, it was very simple. Uh, it used a .NET construct to basically execute whatever parameters you fed it. Uh, it kind of sort of analogous to some of the function injection vulnerabilities we've written about recently. So, uh, I mean. It, there's not a lot of info about that apart from the fact that it was there. I do know that FireEye has uh, released a number of uh, Yara rules, uh, snort signatures, basically ways to detect if your organization or enterprise has been impacted by this malware, uh, by both malware variants, in fact. Uh, and I believe Microsoft has also uh, added detections to their security products to you know, notify you if, they, if they've detected anything uh, that they've found. So that's the good news. Um, Dave Harrington is asking how affected organizations can recover from the solar winds attack. And presumably the attackers have pivoted into other systems, yes. Uh, so this is going to be a per organization thing. Uh, I mean, if we talk about, you know, principle of least privilege and uh, secure configuration management a lot here. Uh, and Every organization is different. Some organizations were only using it for monitoring, so the attacker might not have been able to penetrate as far into it, into uh, their systems. Uh, other organizations may have used it for configuration management and been further compromised. Pretty much organizations would recover from this the way they'd recover from any large scale breach, which is look in every nook and cranny, uh, make sure that you don't have any users that you don't need, make sure that all users only have the uh, privileges that they should have, uh, only be a lot more thorough about it. Uh, check for you know data exfiltration, check for uh, any requests to outside the network that don't belong. And uh, yeah, and yes, uh, Face kick flicks brings up that Splunk is more for monitoring and filtering logs than for configuration management. I have used it for that, uh, but, you know. Do we and, know anything else that Microsoft has done? You'd, you'd mentioned the detection there. Uh, Chloe, do uh, we have Microsoft, any more info on that? Um, is it kind of I don't unsure know. to this point? Yeah, I don't know. I, sorry, I don't know if I... I I don't have the answer. Sorry. I don't either. I, that's why I asked. I'm sorry to put you on the spot. But uh, yeah. as far as we know, what they've done is uh, they and a couple other security firms, uh, Palo Alto, FireEye, uh, have, you know, they've done some reverse engineering. They've done some looking into it. But I think as far as actual action, all they've done is seize the C2 domains and uh, put out detection signatures and info. Um, we did get some requests about whether or not WordPress is a valuable target for nation states. And the answer is, we don't know. Uh, it About a third of the internet runs on WordPress. And that is something that we were actually going to bring up. Uh, so it, it's possible that just by sheer volume and the ability to deliver a you know large scale distributed denial of service attack or even just a large scale attack in general being able to command all of WordPress would be very valuable to just about anyone. Uh, and we have seen, you know, we've, we've seen attacks that against WordPress that seem to have been fairly organized that have had C2 infrastructure. Uh, in some cases, even, you know, what appeared to be dedicated C2 infrastructure, uh, but there's not really a way to tell whether it's a nation state or just really organized crime, which, uh, given that there's a profit motive, the latter seems more likely. Uh, 
one thing that we did want to talk about is back in 2016 where we found a potential exploit that could have led to something like this in WordPress. Uh, so our lead developer, Matt Berry, uh, found a cryptographic weakness in how the WordPress update API servers uh, accepted commands from GitHub when developers, uh, basically they had a webhook set up so that when uh, new code was uh, pushed to GitHub, uh, it would could push those updates to the update server directly. And uh, it turned out that you could tell it which, uh, which cryptographic library to use. Wait, hold on, let me double check. Uh, which which signing method to use or which hash to use, I think. Uh, and it turns out that, you know, by default, it used a fairly strong hashing mechanism, but you could tell it to use a really weak one, meaning that instead of taking, you know, several billion years to brute force the right signature, uh, you could do it in maybe like 100,000 requests or fewer and send a command to the update server. And once you have code execution on an update server, you can take it over. And then uh, the next time, you know, WordPress sites check to see if there's any updates available or auto updates available, which it does for minor versions, uh, you could tell them to download from your, you know, your malicious site, download the, the malicious update instead of the legitimate one. Uh, fortunately, uh, Matt Berry found it, uh, he reported it to WordPress core, and they got it fixed uh, fairly quickly. Uh, so crisis averted in that case. Um, since then, WordPress has added the support for code signing, basically support to check uh, that uh, code has been cryptographically signed before updating. Uh, it's not in, it's not fully in use yet. Uh, it's just it has the capability to do it. Uh, but as we've seen with Solar Winds, even that's not a hundred percent of a fix. That's just. I mean, everything with security is you just have to, you know, take it in layers and fix the things you can and nothing's going to be 100 percent. But if you combine that with, you know, best practices, uh, separation of duties, making sure that uh, people only have the privileges they need, then you can get something approaching secure. Now, hopefully we can get that link to the article that you were talking about uh, involving uh, WordPress there. We have a few graphics to show. Uh, I believe we have a picture of Billy, an updated picture. Ooh. Aww. And we're not sure if Billy has any involvement in the solar winds issue there, but... Uh, she, I don't think she's an APT. No, I think we're hiring. I think we could use one. <laughs> I think we could use another person. Or, she's an oh, APP. <laughs> she's an advanced persistent pooch. Oh. <laughs> Uh, we also have a graphic of our swag winners. So we will show the 10, I believe, yes, 10 that got the uh, Yost won again. <laughs> yes, we got Yost there. Um, so our swag question was, what does APT stand for? And as we just mentioned, advanced persistent threat. So congratulations to you 10 there. We will be sending an email out and get in contact with you to get an address. I believe we would have Yosis, but you will get an email, I'm sure. <laughs> um, so before we uh, recap this, um, you know, we went over a lot. Uh, can you roll, do you think it's safe to roll anybody out as far as who did this, Chloe or Ram? Uh, is it seeming like a nation state pretty conclusively here? I think we can roll out script kitties. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think we can roll out Mason Soiza too. Yeah. <laughs> um, that, uh, so uh, I believe Joe Mandia did say that he believes that only Russia or China have the capabilities and the desire to do this. Uh, and uh, Microsoft has called whoever did this extremely irresponsible for just the amount of eroding trust it's caused because of the number of, you know, pivotal organizations that this has impacted and the fact that, you know, no one's going to trust anything online for a long time. But then again, they said that about the Equifax hack as well. And I think most of us have just gotten used to everyone knowing our social security numbers, <laughs> which is not a good thing. But yeah, uh, I mean, you know, organizations will recover. Uh, some of them, most of them hopefully will improve their practices. Uh, will improve their vetting, uh, will vet their supply chains better. Uh, and 
something like this will undoubtedly happen again, uh, but it will, it will have been harder for the attackers next time. Uh, it might impact fewer people. Uh, Scott Lewis is saying that the fact that it happened suggests that the trust was false trust all along, doesn't it? Uh, and I mean, that is, you know, that's a really good point. You know, I, we occasionally get a hard time for, you know, disclosing vulnerabilities, even though we practice responsible disclosure. We always make sure that the plugin developer is alerted before we tell anyone else uh, and has had time to, you know, fix their code or update the plugin or, you know, worst case scenario, if we can't get in touch with them, we contact the plugins team and have them pull the plugin before we let anyone know about uh, the vulnerability we're, we found. Uh, but yeah, I mean, software has bugs. Uh, I, I think that it's safe to say that, you know, not all trust is misplaced, that perhaps in this case, Solar Winds probably should have uh, had a better security posture, and so trust in them was a little bit misplaced, especially for something that critical. Uh, I don't necessarily know that trust in the organizations that use them was misplaced, because that's kind of the whole point of a supply chain attack. You can't be sure that everyone who supplies everyone you use for everything is perfect all the time. Uh, all you can do is do your best and adapt and fix things when they happen. Now we talked about, you know, kind of wrapping this up with, with WordPress and, and we shared our blog post there um, where, you know, some potential large issues were prevented. Uh, so this, something along these lines could happen with WordPress, but the motive would certainly or very likely be different. Yeah. Uh, Dave Nathanson asks why it would take a huge org to do this hack. Can't any strong hacker team do big hacks? And I mean, the answer is yes. Uh, there are private organizations that could do this, um, but the amount of effort it would take to pivot, that was really the, the one of the other things. Apart from having dedicated infrastructure, getting the back door in place was only the first stage. Uh, from there, the attackers dug a lot deeper into the organizations they decided to target, something that would take a degree of expertise. And the number of organizations did kind of suggest a larger team. Uh, and that, I mean, yes, infrastructure is a lot cheaper than it used to be, but, you know, a lot of the time if you see commercial attackers, they'll, you know, use commodity uh, stuff. They'll use botnets that they rent by the hour or, you know, buy a chunk of. Uh, they often don't set up their own infrastructure unless there's a clear profit motive. So, yeah, uh, it could have been a highly skilled hacker team, but most highly skilled hacker teams uh, that aren't uh, on our side are typically, you know, hired by nation states and organized crime. Uh, at least the ones that are, you know, not individual. So we think that, uh, as Chloe said, you know, we can probably roll out the uh, script kitties, but I'm not so sure that we can roll out Billy yet, but you two we can't roll out Billy. <laughs> nope. We found, we've we finally managed attribution. Uh, and I mean, looks kind of guilty there too. She I, does. I it's just, yeah, yeah. Billy, did you hack solar winds? Did you? Don't think she'll ever tell. No. Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, to, to wrap it up, uh, we got a few minutes here. Any Anything else to add on the solar winds, uh, what we know, what we discussed, anything? Uh, we got a question from Albacost, which is th that Microsoft has also seen traces inside their system. Uh, and how bad it could be if Windows updates are trojanized? Uh, that is a worst case scenario. Uh, Microsoft has been fairly, fairly careful to use these configuration best practices uh, they claim that their customers would not have been impacted like this. Uh, there was some talk of uh, some Azure uh, web services. Uh, basically, they had a host to guest uh, VMware exploit as well that may have been used where uh, an attacker who was able to get onto their systems could have seen what was happening inside of containers uh, used by their customers. But uh, that still wouldn't necessarily impact Windows updates, which I suspect are uh, guarded fairly heavily. That's, that's yeah, that's that would be a worst case scenario. And uh, yeah. So um, it will know, truly be the year of Linux on the desktop if that ever happens. <laughs> I like the uh, script puppies comment. Uh, <laughs> Billy is uh, 
one of a kind. Um, so I know you two are working on a lot behind the scenes, and uh, we got a little break coming up, but uh, very busy today. So that that is always um, my time to pitch the mailing list. Uh, Chloe and Ram and the rest of the Threat Intel team are very busy. So if you're not subscribed currently to the mailing list, uh, get over there and get your email on there and keep an eye out. We have new posts coming out fairly regularly. Uh, and, and get eyes on anything that could be security related on your site. If you're a premium member, you're getting the premium firewall rules and you're protected there. If you enjoyed this video, go ahead and hit the like button. You can subscribe. Uh, we go live each Tuesday at noon, 9 a.m. Pacific. We will not be here next Tuesday, but we will be back the following Tuesday with an awesome show. We might even get Mark back on. He's got two in a row so far. so. <laughs> Uh, he missed the memo with the uh, the ugly sweaters, though, um, and the bells or antlers, which I missed that one. So, but uh, maybe next time, next Christmas, I'll uh, I'll get caught up on that. Uh, Ram, tell us a little bit about uh, WordFence Central before we go for anybody who isn't using it right now. Uh, so WordFence Central is a central way to uh, configure your WordFence sites, and don't worry, the amount of control that you could have over a site with WordFence Central is still not enough to do something like this or to let someone completely take over your site. So uh, it's still pretty safe, uh, but safe. basically it lets you uh, manage your, you know, firewall settings, uh, manage your, you know, how WordFence is set up when you get alerts. Uh, it lets you keep track of, you know, security related events uh, all in one place so that you don't have to keep on getting emails from a bunch of sites. You can just take a look at the events tab and say, oh, hey, uh, looks like a couple of people logged into this site and that site. And it looks like uh, this IP was blocked because it was up to no good on that site. Uh, and you can get, you know, an email digest from all of your sites letting you know what happened. Uh, you can run scans from it. Uh, you can pretty much configure just word events however you want. Yep. And the templates make it easy. If you have a bunch of sites, uh, you can throw them on there. If you have multiple people who work on all those sites, you can set up a team right in WordFence Central. Very easy to do. Uh, also, Ram, the uh, podcast is coming up on episode 100, which I'm sure you guys are going to have a cool little episode planned. We're going to have a super secret special guest, though I think we may do, be doing that. I'm not sure when the, po the next podcast is coming out, but uh, we are going to have a super secret special guest, I think. Yeah, so keep an eye on that. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say, Chloe and I, I think we're also going to have some blog posts about the Solar Winds thing coming out sometime in the next week. So uh, stay tuned if you want to subscribe to our mailing list because we're going to write more about this stuff, especially if you missed any of the stuff we talked about. Yep, and I know we have a lot of up. other stuff too. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you two have been busy. So uh, yeah, get, get signed up for the mailing list. You can also sign up for a podcast list if you want to be notified whenever uh, episode 100 goes live. You can see that on uh, Spotify, iTunes, or wherever else you uh, check out your podcasts. All right, uh, Chloe Ram, anything else to add before we head out here for uh, Christmas vacation? And well, just close. That, we're, we're getting there. Yeah. And just that it's always a pleasure, and thanks for watching, everyone. Yeah, and Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Yes, we appreciate it. Thanks, everybody, and have a good rest of the week. If you're celebrating Christmas, I hope it's amazing. If not, have an amazing rest of the week, and we'll catch you next year. And I hope 2021 Thanks. is better than 2020. Yep. <laughs> high hopes, high hopes. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye.